Would the uh, ushers come forward, please? And we're going to continue to worship the Lord in our tithes and offerings this morning. Leroy, would you mind praying over the offering?
like being gracefully broken. Like as I'm singing that song and the, all those how you know it's you think, I can't do this. <laughs> what I do every week, I can't do this. <sighs> Look out, God. And here I am. I want to be gracefully broken.
you, Jesus. Father, we just come to you today. We open up our hearts. We shout your name. Just reach us right where we're at. Whatever we're struggling with today, Lord, whatever it is that's heavy on our hearts, we just give it to you right now. We lift up your name and praise you and glorify you in this place. In Jesus' name.
presence in this place. There's nothing more precious to us than being in your presence and sitting at your feet and having you bless us as we just soak up the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, help us to never tire of being in your presence. You said if we ask anything in your name, we have faith like a mustard seed, as we talked about this morning in Sunday school. Lord, you said that you will do it if we ask it in your name and it's in your will. So Lord, whatever it is today that each person here needs, you said very clearly in the Bible, you have not because you ask not. So whatever it is, whether it's pain, discomfort, illness, whether it's relationships, whether it's finance, Lord, whatever it is that's weighing heavy on each person here today, whatever burdens they're carrying, to, we just ask you today, we leave them at your feet, we just ask you to move in each one of those situations. By the miraculous power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, we know right now in the name of Jesus that all those burdens are gone. We just lay them at your feet, Father. We thank you and praise you for your goodness and your mercy and your grace in our lives. Once again, thank you for your presence in this place. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Thank you. You may be seated. We're getting some much needed rain out there. That's that's a good thing. Um, before I begin diving into my uh, message today, I have I spent the week or part of the week in Kalispell at our network uh, council, which is basically um, the business meeting and and a bunch of uh, fellowship and teaching. And every year they have a different theme. This year it was definitely on church planting and discipleship, um, which which are both really important. Um, and and I felt like for the first time in a in a while, like this uh, series of messages and and teaching was directly for me. Sometimes you go to these things and you pick up a few nuggets and it's great, and then every once in a while it just hits you right in the face. And this was one of those times. Um, so we had a we had a wonderful uh, three days of teaching and and fellowship and worship and all those things over in Kalispell. The the person who was um, presenting most of the teaching was a, a guy named uh, Don. I'll come. I'll think of his name in a little while. Don Kelly, um, and he is the network superintendent of the Northwest District, which is basically Washington State, a little bit of Oregon, I believe, and the upper part of uh, Idaho. And so he challenged us during that time to, um, to become a planting and reproducing network um, in our churches. And he shared something that was just amazing to me. Now, keep in mind, we have 84 Assemblies of God churches in Montana. I think they have about 300 or 350 in the Northwest District. But last year, during the middle of COVID, they planted 147 new churches in in Washington. 147 new churches. Now, most of them don't look like this. Most of them look like dinner church or a small community gathering, but they fall underneath the authority of another church and they become their own body, their own entity. And it looks a lot like the New Testament church. And we spent a lot of time talking about Acts and the model of church and, and how, how we believe that a lot of the pressures that are happening around us in society 
and some of the legal th stuff that's going on is going to drive the church, not underground, but definitely more like the New Testament church. And uh, so we're really excited as a network to do that. He actually challenged us to plant 100 churches this year. I don't know if that's even possible, but we're going to trust God for it. We have faith. <laughs> um, the other thing I was so proud of, and, and I would just want to share it with you guys. On Tuesday afternoon, we had a uh, missions luncheon. And we have that every year. They usually bring in somebody to speak that's maybe itinerating or, or something. In this case here, they had a video from Tanzania. And this video was talking about how they want to plant 40,000 churches in the next 10 years in Tanzania. And they need Bible school uh, people. They need people to teach, and they need physical Bible schools. So they're actually trying to raise money. And the network, our network here in Montana is trying to raise, I believe it's $40,000 to build a Bible school there in the next year or two. Um, if God lays anything like that in your heart, come talk to me and I'll get you connected with um, the district. But during that missions recognition, there was a, there's always a little handout and a little brochure kind of thing that um, lists the top churches in each category uh, across the state for giving to missions. There's... I think it was a typo, but zero to 50 in attendance. I don't know how you can have a church with zero, but <laughs> anyway, zero to 50 in attendance. Um, then 51 to 100, which is our category. And then 50, or 101 to 250, I think. And then 250 to 350 or somewhere in that neighborhood, 350 and above. Now, as a network, we gave a little over $4 million last year to missions, both U.S. and international. It's amazing, isn't it? What was really, really exciting for me is to see our church's name on that list. So for U.S. missions last year in the Category 2, which is where we fall, we gave $6,800. or No, I'm sorry. It was $6,660 and change. Because somebody joked to me. Couldn't have given another dollar to, so it didn't say 666 in it. <laughs> but anyway, it was um, our church gave uh, more than to U.S. missions, more than the church that gave the most in the next one up too, and much more than the one below us. So, so our church, I've always known, has a heart for giving and for missions, but that just validates that, that heart that we have and, and the generosity of everyone here to give to missions. And I just thank you guys for that, and the district thanks you for that, and the missionaries who are out there in the field thank you for that as well. Um, one last thing, we have a couple of things in, in the, uh, the bulletin coming up. But one of, one of them we're doing is a pinochle tournament again. Everybody had fun the last time, and so we're going to do that next Sunday at 1 o'clock. Same basic format as the last time, but uh, we're hoping that maybe we'll have uh, Susie and Michael will actually be able to play, and we'll have an uh, organization a little different to make the scorekeeping easier. But we had a great time, and uh, you know, part of, part of having uh, a community of believers is to have fun and enjoy each other's company. We talk about that, but we don't always follow up on it. So this is an opportunity for anybody that has any desire to even learn how. I mean, I think, Tony, you first time you ever played was that tournament, right? And you ended up in the mid pack. You you were pretty and and Aria, same thing, right? He was third, right? Yeah. So you don't have to know how to play. You can just you can learn on the fly if you need to. It'll be fun. But but the reality is that we should have fun in each other's company. Amen. We should be able to do things that you know get bring us joy and bring us pleasure because Jesus said he came to give us life more abundantly. And, and so that, that joy that we have with fellowshipping with each other really is, is godly, and it's something that builds us up in our faith. You see also that we have a, a missions dinner the, the following week on May 13th. I think that's Thursday of that week. Um, that's the first of three that we've scheduled in. So one in May, one in June, and one in July. In, in June, uh, Dorothy's son, uh, grandson and, and his family will be here, and they're going to be missionaries in Burundi. And then uh, in, uh, in July, we're going to have Grace Anderson, who um, is going to Africa as a missionary assistant. I think that's all the announcements, so now we can get to the good stuff. <laughs> um, actually, it's not. I just saw my notes. We've, I've been asked to do a baptism, and uh, 
I'm excited for that, but I'd like to give other people the opportunity. So we're going to wait a few weeks before we decide to uh, schedule that out. If anybody has any interest in being baptized, please let me know so that we can try to coordinate dates when you'll, people will be here. And uh, I'd love to have a, a regular occurrence of new people coming to Christ and being baptized. That would be, that's the goal of the church in, in, in Acts. They went out and they preached and people were, you know, repented and were saved and baptized. And uh, that's the model that we want to have as well. So we're going to do that. The other thing that we want to get going is a membership class. So I know that there's one or two people that have asked me about it. If you have any interest in becoming a member, it's not going to be a big, long thing. It'll probably be one or two classes on maybe a Sunday afternoon. And uh, just to, so that you understand what our church is all about, that you understand what being a member means and the, the responsibilities and the... And the uh, um, expectations of that and so we we just want to go through and and lay that out before we go ahead and, and vote on you as a member and then the last thing would be if you have any interest in doing any children's ministry work especially as it relates to children's church um, we're looking to start children's church around the end of school so for the summer and uh, we need some volunteers so that we don't have to have the same people stuck in there every week. Um, we're looking for at least somebody for the older children and somebody for uh, infants up to about three. If in an ideal world, we would actually have three people each week and we would split the kids, the older ones, into two groups. But if you have any interest in that, if you could see Randy at the end of the service, um, and we'll try to get a sign-up sheet going this week or next um, to... Uh, pass around if anybody has any interest in it. But if God's speaking to you in that regard, just uh, you know, listen to Him and and uh, be open to the possibility of doing it. We're going to have some curriculum that will um, allow you not to have to be coming up with plans from scratch. And uh, so it's it's something that's important that you understand the, the the Bible and you understand theology, but you don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to come up with it all on your own. Today we're going to look at the third lesson. Our series has been so so all may know. Um, we're talking about the the lessons that Jesus taught his disciples during the time between when he was resurrected and when he ascended to heaven. When somebody's near the end of their life, it's usually a time when they really get right down and laser focused as to what's most important. Right when they start to feel like, hey, you know, I I only have a month to live, six months to live, three weeks to live. Everything that's irrelevant kind of gets slept, swept off to the side. And the only things that are left is the things that matter. And so we know that Jesus was coming to the end of his life here on this earth. The end of his ministry, he was going to ascend to heaven. And we know that during that time, everything that he did is important. So we're looking at that in the context of the things that he did that we believe we can learn from. During that 40 days, he focused most of his time, as you can see, on building up his disciples. He didn't go out there anymore and, and heal the sick and have big gatherings on the side of the mountain and teach people. At that point, he knew that he didn't have enough time to take care of it, but he knew who could. And that was his disciples, his church. And so during that time, he focused on equipping those disciples to do the kingdom work after he was gone. And you know, Paul talks about the, the job of, of pastors he talks about in 1 Timothy, that our job is to equip the saints to do the ministry. And so and that, uh, my hope is that while we go through this series here, that you'll learn some tools necessary to help you to do the work of the ministry. doesn't mean I don't do it, but my job, my primary job is to equip you guys. And so... First week, we talked about Jesus modeling listening and hearing where people were coming from, where their stories originated from, and how their culture and their history affected their input or their, um, their outlook now on life. And we should be able to listen and when we're talking to people, understand and have empathy for where they're coming from and what their fears are so that we can be most effective in ministering to them. Then last week, we talked about Jesus addressing 
the followers that, that were living in fear. They were behind closed doors. And, and, and really understanding that Jesus offered them hope in place of their fear. He didn't condemn them. There was no condemnation, but rather hope and in building of their faith. In fact, he knew that some of them weren't going to be able to believe unless they saw, like Thomas. And so he made sure to go out of his way to do whatever he could to eliminate the fear and build hope and faith in its place. You know, we, we followed that up by saying this world is going to let you down and there's going to be times when you're fearful and afraid. But Jesus has a way to deal with fear. And He says, take heart, I have overcome the world. We have the ability in Him to overcome whatever the enemy's schemes are. And so we know that that hope that we have in Him, the hope of life after death and the hope of, of us living forever with Him, that carries us through. And so today we're going to look at one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and it's, it's a, a story of restoration and hope. It's a pretty long passage, and I'm just going to breeze through it, and then we'll break it down a little bit. But the call to follow Christ isn't an easy one. And as humans, um, you know, we're, we're going to make mistakes, and we're going to face failure. But God's call in our lives remains unchanged. I know a lot of people have probably heard this, but you know, when I was a teenager, I knew that God called me to preach. I knew He called me to be a pastor. And like, like the prodigal son and like uh, so many others in the Bible, I ran from that. But God's call never left my life. It remained on my life and it remained unchanged. And just like the story we're going to read today, Jesus offers full restoration and forgiveness and empowers us to pick up right where we left off and just keep going and working for Him after we fall short. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen? And so today, before we get into the Scripture, have you ever had a situation maybe in a child or a coworker or a spouse or somebody who, who kept repeatedly asking you the same question even though you'd answered it before and your answer hadn't changed in the last five minutes? You can think of, are we there yet? How long until we're there? Um, what's for dinner? Right? You know, all those kind of things, right? Your answer didn't change, but think about when that happens and somebody repeatedly asks you, does your response start to change a little? Even though the answer doesn't change, does the tone of your voice change a little bit? Maybe your patience level gets a little lower. I know mine does. And the reality is that this story is very much like that, and we're going to see that. Uh, Jesus asked Peter a simple question. And Peter responded. And Jesus asked him again. You probably guessed where it is, but it's John 21, verses 1 through 25. It's the whole chapter. We're going to read it quickly, like I said. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, which is Peter. James, Thomas, nicknamed the twin. Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee. The sons of Zebedee and two other disciples. So there's seven of them there total. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out of the boat, out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. Doesn't make any sense, does it? I mean, is the water that much different on this side of the boat than that side? No. But they did it anyway, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. And then the disciple Jesus loved, remember a couple of weeks ago on Easter when we talked about that? This is John talking in the third person and telling everybody how much Jesus loved him. <laughs> the disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, in typical Simon Peter fashion, he put on his tunic and jumped in the water and headed for shore. He had no hesitation whatsoever. He ran to the Father when he saw him. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the, landed, the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards 
from shore. And when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire, and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. And it was the third time that Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he'd been raised from the dead. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Pointing to the other disciples. And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. And Jesus repeated the question, are we there yet? What's for dinner? Simon, son of John, do you love me? If you notice, he didn't say more than these this time around. But he says, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. The third time he asked Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. At this point, he's getting almost as frustrated as he was the third time that servant girl asked, weren't you with Jesus? I'm surprised he didn't swear an oath right in here, you know. Anyway, he says, I, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself. and You went whenever, wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. First he told him, feed my sheep. Now he tells him, follow, follow me. And Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved. John, the one who leaned over to Jesus during supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. So the rumor spread among the community of believers that this disciple wouldn't die. But that isn't what Jesus said at all. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This disciple, John, is the one who testifies to these events and has recorded them here. And we know that this account of these things is accurate. And Jesus also did many other things. And if they were all written down, I suppose the whole world couldn't contain the books that would be written. So this morning, I just want to dig into a couple of pieces of this story. But in order to get the context, we really had to read the whole thing. These events took place at least eight days after the Resurrection Sunday based on the timeline of the Gospels. And John writes that when Jesus appeared to them by the lake, it was the third time that He'd appeared to them. The first time was behind closed doors with everybody but Thomas. The second time was with everybody including Thomas. And then now. And so they'd returned to their old vocation. They returned to fishing Presumably because they didn't have any idea what else to do. And whether they were right or wrong in that decision, one of the commentaries that I was reading about this said they put their fishing enterprise in the best possible light. Previous to the crucifixion of our Lord, the temporal necessities of Himself and His disciples appear to have been supplied by the charity of other individuals. Just really quickly, Luke uh, 8, verses 1, 2, and 3 says that Jesus was teaching with His disciples, and He has 12 disciples with Him, plus Mary Magdalene and some other women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. And then this verse here says, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. So my the picture in my mind is maybe they just like, you know, said, well, Jesus is gone. We're not going to have any more support. I guess we better buckle up and start working. We better go back to what we know. And so whether that was right or wrong, that's what they did. They went back 
And they began to do the thing that they knew how to do to make a living. Whatever their reasoning was, because I, I, I don't want to presume that that was the reason, but for whatever reason, they went back. And in verses 3 through 6, we find that they're out there and they're trying in their own effort and nothing's happening. How many times do we try things on our own effort when we think Jesus is gone? He's not with me right now. He's just, he's got other things that are more important to do. He'd, be, he'd appeared to them twice before they knew he was alive, but they had given up. They hadn't continued on with what he had called them to do many times. Instead, they went back to what they knew. And I think that's really indicative of a lot of what we do as humans, is we just go back and do whatever we know best to do in our own power, instead of relying on the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus comes there and he says, hey, throw your nets on the other side, because that's where all the fish are. Makes no sense. Makes zero sense. But Jesus doesn't always have to make sense, right? What he tells us to do, he wants us to believe in faith that it's true and to act on it. And if we use that faith to, to believe what Jesus says is true and therefore act on it, then we're going to reap a harvest just like, this, just like the, the, the disciples did. And so as soon as they did that, of course, Peter hears from John, hey, you know, that's Jesus. Peter didn't figure that out on his own. He listened to John. He also believed not only that the fish were on the other side of the boat, but that that was really Jesus come to help them out. So he gets he throws his robe on, his tunic, and he, he runs off the boat. I, I, I'm guessing 100 yards. Maybe the water wasn't too deep there, and he could just run. I'm picturing a splash coming up behind him and as he's running towards Jesus. And he gets there. And Jesus, before, if you read that closely, I'm not going to dive into it too much, but Jesus sends him back to help go get the fish and drag him back in. Uh, drag the, the net that last little bit for the, with the other disciples. But after that, he sits down and, and they have breakfast. Jesus prepared them a meal. He'd already, he had fish on the grill before they ever got back with those other fish on the fire. He had bread already prepared for them. So he sits down and they're all refreshed. They've all eaten together and they're all at that point probably just enjoying Jesus' company. And then Jesus turns to Peter and asks him a hard question. It doesn't say he took Peter aside privately over on the other side of the beach and asked him this question. It just said he looked at Peter straight in the eye and he said, do you love me more than these? That indicates right there that the others were there. He turned to him like, do you love me more than these guys do? Peter says, of course, you know I do. And then he starts talking about his calling. Remember, Jesus had already told Peter he was going to build his church on him before all everything blew up. Before Jesus was crucified, before Peter denied him, he had called him. And he had told him what his destiny was in Christ. And so he told him to do exactly what his destiny was, that is, feed my lambs. There's an interesting thing about this particular passage. Jesus asked the first two times, in, in our English translations, each time it says, do you love me? But if you read the Greek underlying those words, the first two are phileo, which is, I'm sorry, I got it backwards. The first two are agapo, and agapo has the, the, the sense of an all-giving, an uncausing, an unselfish love. In other words, it's, it's the, the love that God has for us that has no limits, and it's completely unselfish. And Peter responds with, yes, I love you, phileo. He responds with a, a, a Greek word for love that's more of a reciprocal kind of a love, a friendly affection like, yeah, you're my friend. And some translations express Peter's answer as, I'm your friend. 
Um, but most of them say, yes, I love you. Because love is the root word for all those different nuances in the, in the Greek language. So twice, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me as deeply as you claimed to before? Remember, he said, I will die with you. I, even if these other guys over here, if, even if they leave, I'm never going to leave you. Not me. I'm gonna, I'll die with you. A few hours later, he couldn't even say he knew him. And so Jesus is asking him, I think, for two reasons. Number one, he wants to bring that home with Peter that, you know, you were pretty full of yourself back there. You said that you were going to love me more than those guys, and you don't even like me. You don't love me. Because if you did, you wouldn't have rejected me. You wouldn't have denied me three times when your life was on the line. When the chips were down, you didn't follow me, but you know what? I, I love you anyway. And he continues on this line of questioning. And he, and he does it to remind Peter that his calling hasn't been ruined because of his failure in life. His failure ultimately strengthened him. It made him love Jesus even more than he did before. Because before it was empty words. Before everything that he said that night before Jesus was arrested went right out the window. Now, as we know from reading the New Testament, Peter did go to jail for Jesus. He did suffer beatings. He ultimately was crucified upside down. Just like Jesus told him. Jesus said, hey, you know, in the middle of all this, he says, take care of my sheep. But then after he says that three times, he tells him, you know, you're going to be led away to die the same way I did. You're going to be led away into a place that you don't want to go. And that's because you love me that you're going to do that. And so he began to realize a couple of things. Number one, that his life wasn't over, his ministry wasn't over because he made a few bad choices. Jesus has called each one of us to do something. Each one of us, at some point in our life, has, has felt that God put a call on your life for whatever it is. It could be something really simple. It could be something as, as big as ministry. But it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you're at right now. That call is still valid. And Jesus doesn't hold our past against us. Our future is in Him. Our past is our past. You know, there's a lot of missionaries that are in, the, in areas of the world that they have to make this decision every day. And we think, man, you know, it's not anything I'm going to have to deal with, whether I have, you know, my physical health or my well-being or, or my life. Uh, whether whether that's uh, a choice I'm going to have to make as a Christian. But the reality is that the farther and farther we get towards the end times, the more that's going to happen. The closer that Jesus' return is, the more He says that the, the world is going to be a battleground and we're going to be stuck in the middle. So we need to be prepared to do anything that Jesus asks us to do, including up to and including giving our life for Him. There's so many things in the New Testament that talk about that. And He was just reminding Peter of that. And He's reminding us of that too as we look at this story. He wants to know when He asked Peter this question, and when, when He asks us this question, do we really love Jesus enough to risk everything, including life and health and wealth and all the conveniences of this world? Is do we really love Him that much? Or are we just friends? Are we, are we simply going through the motions because we like being around Jesus? He's a great guy. He helps us out. He gives us blessings. Or do we love Him with that unconditional love that He had for us? And so as Jesus questioned His love, or questioned Peter about His love for Him, He, he was ultimately asking Peter to make a decision about whether he's going to move forward in his calling 
and be a fisher of men or if he was going to just continue on being a fisherman. Jesus knew that Peter was going to fail again in the future. In his role as a leader, he, he failed sometimes. He didn't do everything perfectly. But ultimately, Jesus knew that he was going to succeed in the calling that Jesus put on his life. Just like he knows that I'm going to and you're going to succeed in the calling that he has on our lives. He just needs us to understand that. He needs us to believe and have faith that he's called us, he's equipped us, and he's going to see us through. And so he cemented that response in Peter's mind, yes, Lord, I love you more than anything. We also saw that he was very humbled during that time because he had been so proud with the other disciples. Jesus had to knock him down a few pegs. He had to put him in a place where he realized his sinfulness and his failure before God. He knew that he needed Jesus and he needed the Holy Spirit to help him. And that if he had that, even with all of his shortcomings, that he was going to succeed in this ministry. So just like Peter, I, I think as believers, we're going to experience hardships. We're going to experience failures. And we're even sometimes maybe going to turn our back on what God's called us to do. We're going to have situations where we lean on our own resources and our own understanding instead of trusting in God for whatever it is that He has for us. But even through all that, when, when, whether we stand or whether we fall, whether we obey or we don't obey, I want you to remember what I said earlier. God's call in our lives still remains the same. It remains unchanged regardless of what we do. And that, to me, is the beauty of this passage that not only this passage, but all of Scripture shows a couple of things. God uses broken people. How many of us are broken in here? God uses people who have failed, people who are broken. If we look at that passage that I read a little while ago, He had the disciples and a bunch of women with Him traveling and supporting His ministry who had all been broken and had been healed and delivered by Jesus. As children of God, we're being called to be ambassadors to the world. And, and the world needs to see that even though we're broken, even though we're hurting, even though we fall down and we don't always get back up as quickly as we'd like to, and even though sometimes we turn our back on what God might have called us to do, that He, he offers restoration and forgiveness to everyone who calls on His name, everyone who loves Him and trusts Him and has faith. I'm going to close with this Scripture right here. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's the number one job that Jesus came here for. The only thing. That's why at the end of His ministry, all He wanted to do is equip the saints to be ready to share the Gospel. And this is Paul talking. He says, and I'm the worst of them all. I am the worst. Today, you know, I might think or you might think, I've done some pretty bad things. I don't know if God can use me. Peter was sitting there saying, God, I'm unworthy. I, I don't know why You chose me to lead Your church. Look at me. I couldn't even... Hold up my end of the bargain for a couple hours in the courtyard while you were being put on trial. But Paul goes on to say, but God. Those are my two favorite words, but God. But God had mercy on me. I wasn't worthy. I was a sinner. But God had mercy on me. Who remembers what mercy is from this morning? Unmerited favor. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, mercy is the opposite. That's grace. Mercy is that you don't get what you do deserve. But they're very closely related. And we, went, we had a long discussion in Sunday school about that today. <laughs> um, so Jesus, God had mercy on me so that Jesus could use me as a prime example of His great patience with even the worst of sinners. 
It's exactly what he did with Peter. He had mercy on him. Peter deserved way different than what he got. He got breakfast and a pep talk <laughs> instead of what he deserved. But Jesus can use him as an example with even the worst of sinners. That's what he's telling, that's what Paul's telling us here. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. You know, God uses us despite our failures. He uses us despite all the things that people might say about us that they think disqualifies us from being saved or from following Jesus. I thank God that my failures don't define me. I don't know where I'd be if my failures were what defined my life. But they don't also, they don't limit my effectiveness for Christ. Peter was one of the ones that failed the most, is recorded of all the disciples other than Judas. His failures are recorded more than any other. And yet, Jesus built his church on him. He became the rock, the cornerstone of that church in Jerusalem. And, and ultimately, he was the first one that Jesus used to go out and reach the Gentiles. When that sheet came down and he revealed to him all the things that were clean because God created them. And the good news of the gospel is that repentant believers are never disqualified from serving the Lord. Rather, our shortcomings can serve to encourage and equip others that might be facing those same struggles. Some of the most effective people that I've ever seen in ministry are people who came from the worst backgrounds. Because they were saved from something that people can't imagine there was ever any exit from. There was no hope that they would ever have a normal life, a productive life. And yet Jesus came for everyone. And those people, no matter how far they've slipped, have the same calling on their life. There's something in their, in their life that God designed them to do. And if they follow Him and have faith in Him and repent, then God can use them. When other people see that continued trust and faith that we have in, in the Lord, despite our difficulties, despite the, the failures that we have in the flesh, then the gospel is going to continue to spread both, both here in Chester and throughout the, the ends of the earth, as Jesus said. You know, sometimes one of the spiritual gifts that somebody might have is the ability to give to missions, like we talked about earlier, or to give to others. And they may not ever be a good preacher. They may not, might not ever you know, walk up to somebody and, and encourage them, but they give sacrificially to ministry, just like those women that supported Jesus in His ministry. It may be that you're the kind of person that's never going to be able to open up a Bible and share something with somebody, um, but you can certainly come alongside and encourage them. Maybe that's what God's called you to. Maybe God's called you to just be the person that prays in the background. There's all kinds of callings. Callings don't have to look like I'm up. I'm preaching on on a platform, or I'm, you know, out there knocking on doors and winning souls to Christ. There's all kinds of ministry, and so the biggest thing I want you to remember is, if people see our lives and they see that we're repenting and living the way Jesus wanted us to, regardless of what our past is, God can use us, just like He did with Peter. Would you pray with me, Father? We just thank you today that. No matter how broken and badly we've messed up our lives, that you're going to use us if we surrender to you, if we give you our undivided love and, and affection, if we trust you and we have faith in you, Lord, we know that there's nothing that you can't do. Nothing is impossible with you. And so, Father, I just pray that you would open up our hearts to see the calling that's on our lives, to see what you have designed us for and what ministry you would have us to do. No matter how large or small it is, Lord, every person who's a believer in you has a job and a, and a, a ministry, Lord, that you've called them to. So today, I just pray that you would reveal to us the ministry 
that you have for us, that you would help us to be strengthened in the knowledge that no matter what we do, there's hope and there's a future for us beyond anything that we've done in the past, that, that our past doesn't define us, Lord. Pray today that you would use this church, use each one of us in the coming weeks and months to spread the, the good news of your gospel, not only here in Chester, but around the world through all the various ways that we minister, Lord, whether it be online ministry, whether it be our missions giving, whether it be through friends and relatives and acquaintances, Lord, help your word to spread throughout all the circles that we're in because we're obedient to you and we're faithful to your calling. Lord, we thank you today for your grace and your mercy. Without that, we're just, we're just lost sinners trying to make it on our own. And we just thank you for the gift that you gave us uh, by sending your son to die for us on the cross and for making a way that we would be right with you and justified as if nothing had ever happened, as if we'd never sinned. Father, we love you and we thank you today. Just be with us as we go about our weeks. Help us to find our calling and, and really live within that calling and, and become who you'd like us to be. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Look forward to seeing everybody here next week and uh, some fellowship. And uh, if anybody has any interest again in children's ministry, see Randy, and we'll just take you, jot your name down. We don't even know what it looks like yet, but we'd like to know who or how many volunteers we have so we can try to craft something that was going to be most effective for the kids that we are blessed to have in our church. Have a great week. God bless you and keep you. Amen.